from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, thank you very, very much, and thank you for such a warm welcome. I was doing an interview earlier today, and somebody said, what's the difference between the UK fans and your American fans? And the heat <laughs> of the US fans is palpable, I have to say. The other thing I'm really enjoying, apart from the weather, the numbers, my new friends, Mr. President and Mrs. Bush, I have to say, we are tight. Uh, <laughs> is the experience of having a signer at the same time. I've been thinking about really, really difficult words. <laughs> How are you on transubstantiation? <laughs> transubstantiation! <laughs> Very good. Throughout the program, you know, I will try and find incredibly difficult words to stimulate interest generally. It's quite true that I found it very hard to come to Mary, Queen of Scots, and there's a very good reason for that. When I first read about her when I was a girl reading history and historical fiction in England, she seemed to me to be one of the stupidest women <laughs> that had ever mislaid three husbands and three kingdoms. And I knew that when I started work on her, I would have to be working with her for two years. And because I go so deeply into my characters and so deeply into the circumstances of their lives, I thought I cannot spend two years of my life with this idiot. <laughs> in the traditional way that we write history in England, Mary Queen of Scots is incredibly doomed. She is incredibly beautiful. She is Roman Catholic. She is French. There are so many things about her that the English male historian loathes and, and at the same time adores in a kind of slightly taboo and frenzied way that you never get a straight telling of Mary Queen of Scots' story. It's always slightly hysterical. It became clear to me that you couldn't really trust the historical record until historians started, historians started, in a sense, rewriting the record, which they do really every generation. When I was looking at the wives of Henry VIII, including, of course, Anne Boleyn and her sister Mary, who was the other Boleyn girl of that book, and I realized that what we were looking at was not really an account of the lives of the characters, but always an account of the prejudices of the historians. And if you look at the traditional view of the, of the wives of Henry VIII, you really see Catherine of Aragon, absolutely holy, absolutely pure. There is a historian who actually writes, she cannot have told a lie. It is impossible for her to tell a lie. You go, she's a woman. <laughs> <laughs> this is as natural as breathing. You know, she may have thought twice about it. She may have gone to confession having done it, but absolutely she lied about the consummation of her marriage with Prince Arthur. Of course she did, and absolutely she was right to do so, and that defended her claim to the throne and her daughter's inheritance of the throne. So I think she was right, but I think she was a liar. <laughs> Anne Boleyn, I know I will have Anne Boleyn fans in this evening. I love Anne Boleyn too, in a way, but she did try and murder the Archbishop of Canterbury. And in England, that is a very, very bad thing to do. <laughs> Jane Seymour, perfect wife, absolutely perfect wife, married very briefly, virgin at marriage, conceived a child, it was a boy, died in childbirth. The perfect woman. <laughs> there isn't a Victorian historian in England who didn't think that that was the epitome of how to be a good queen. Do the job and get out of the way. <laughs> And so we go through the wives of Henry VIII, and they are all absolutely stereotypes of the male view of women. And that, when I came to start writing, first I wrote The Other Boleyn Girl, and then I found myself drawn to these other characters. It is in some ways a rescuing, sometimes from oblivion, in the case of Mary Boleyn, who historians knew about, but didn't think was at all interesting. And sometimes it's a rescuing from absolute prejudice. And it is the prejudice, I'm sorry to say, for the gentlemen in the audience this evening, from your gender. 2,000 years of patriarchy and it's still showing up on the page and I am here to right that wrong. <laughs> Anti-disestablishmentarianism. <laughs> Do you know, that looked to me exactly the same as transubstantiation. <laughs> So when I came to Mary Queen of Scots, I should have realized that what we would be dealing with would be, uh, in a sense, a gloss, 
a gloss of history put on a real life. And I was very fortunate to read the biography by John Guy of Mary, Queen of Scots, called My Heart is My Own. And I realized that what we had in the case of Mary was a woman much more interesting than the traditional history told us. She was a woman of political power. She was a woman who understood that she had to rule the kingdom and command the kingdom. It wasn't just enough to inherit it. And I think if she had come to any other European kingdom than Scotland, she might indeed have managed it. But Scotland, you know, then as now, I'm sorry to say, very tricky place to run, you know. <laughs> Currently, uh, those of you who are following British history, the Scots are talking about independence and nationalism. Most English people would say as me, okay, <laughs> bye, <laughs> it'll be fine, we can manage. We've had all the, <laughs> actually we've had all the oil, so we don't mind anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but Mary also lacked one key ingredient, which Elizabeth I, in some ways in a very similar situation had. Elizabeth I had this fantastic advisor, William Cecil, who had a vision of how England should be, Protestant, insular, creating an empire, an Anglo-Saxon Protestant empire, and separating from continental Europe. That was his vision. He really persuaded Elizabeth of it, and the two of them made England that we can really recognize as, as England of our past, in a sense that gives us the England we have today. In some ways, gives you some of your history too, since we all come from that period of time. Mary Queen of Scots didn't have anybody like that. Her advisor, David Rizzio, was killed by a conspiracy of the Northern Lords, the Scottish Lords, and thereafter she had to try and run this incredibly dangerous and difficult kingdom on her own. That she failed to do so is actually one of the most interesting parts of the story because it led me to the way I wanted to write the novel. When people talk to me about writing historical fiction in particular, I say one of the great advantages about writing fiction rather than history is that you don't have to start at the very beginning and you certainly don't go on to the very end. If you're a historian, you open up with probably birth and you close with death. That's the life. That's how you'd logically do a biography of a life. If you're writing fiction, you start where it gets interesting. You don't have to start at the beginning. Whenever I read a, a fictional biography or a historical novel and it says, the feeble cry of the newborn child ran out through the castle. I go, no, <laughs> it's born. You know, there's nothing clever or interesting or unique or individual or talented about being born. We've all done it. <laughs> Don't start the story then. Start when something interesting happens. In this novel, more contrary than usual, I've started when most people stop telling her story, which is when she comes to England. She has been, in a sense, she leaves the kingdom of France because her young f husband, the French king, dies. She's driven out of the kingdom of Scotland after the revolution of the Scottish lords and uh, the uh, defeat of her and Bothwell when they take arms up against them. And she arrives in England certain that she will find sanctuary and safety with her cousin, another single woman, a queen, Elizabeth. What happens then is a tragedy which takes actually 16 years to unfold, which is Elizabeth's desire to do right by a fellow queen, to defend the position and the status of monarchy, is steadily undermined by her fear that if Mary gets back on the throne of Scotland, Scotland will become a more and more powerful rival kingdom, and her yet deeper fear that Mary will be her heir. And it is that tension which underpins all this novel. Elizabeth doesn't even appear in it very much, but her anxiety is what goes through Mary's years of captivity. I'd like to read you a very, very little piece from one of the things I have to do uh, from the novel. One of the things I have to do when I'm starting to write a fiction is I have to hear the voices of the characters in my head. And those of you who, who know and like my fiction will know that at the, its very best, it can be quite haunting that you feel that you're there, that you really want to be, in a sense, you want to be there. And one of the ways I do this is by writing in first person, so it's I think this, I think that, and in the present tense. That's only possible for me when I really have a sense of these characters, when they come to me very, very strongly. And when I started to hear the voice of Mary, Queen of Scots, I knew I'd be okay with this novel. I am a queen. Different rules apply for queens. I've had to endure events as a woman that I would never even name as a queen. I would not stoop to acknowledge them. Yes, I have been kidnapped. I have been imprisoned, but I will never, never complain of it. 
As a queen, my person must be inviolate. My body is always holy. My presence is sacred. Shall I lose that powerful magic for the benefit of moaning on about my injuries? Shall I trade majesty itself for the pleasure of a word of sympathy? Would I prefer to command, or do I long to whimper about my wrongs? Shall I order men, or shall I weep at the fireside with other women? If they want rid of me, there is only one way they will get rid of me, but they will never dare to take it. If they want rid of me, they will have to sin against the order of heaven. They will have to defy the God-given chain of being. If they want rid of me, they will have to behead me. Think of that. The only way I cease to be Dowager Queen of France, Queen of Scotland, and the only true heir to the throne of England is when I am dead. They will have to kill me if they want to deny me my throne. And I wager my title, my fortune, and my life that they will never dare to do that. Thank God I am at least safe in this. I will always be safe in this. And the great irony of that belief of hers that she expresses so clearly at the start of the novel is that she's wrong. Elizabeth will find a way to murder another queen, to execute another queen. And the plot to entrap Mary Queen of Scots rolls through the novel like a coffin hearse coming closer. It's a very threatening novel in that sense. And for those of us, even I, who have come to love Mary Queen of Scots, it's a tragic novel in that sense. What, was, what made this novel such a joy to write is not just the discovery of Mary Queen of Scots, but the fact that when she came to England, Elizabeth put her in the house of the only person she could trust in England, that of George Talbot, Earl of Shrewsbury. And he was married to the most extraordinary woman, Elizabeth of Hardwick, Bess of Hardwick. This is a woman so unlike our understanding of how Tudor women are, so unlike the other women of her time that it's hard to believe that she existed, but she was an exceptional woman. She was brought up reasonably poor. She had, uh, her mother was widowed, so there was no money in the family. She was put into one household and married the younger son of the house. When he died, she received a small dowry. She then went to serve in another household as, as kind of a lady in waiting, and she had an arranged marriage. And when that husband died, conveniently enough, she received in his entire fortune. He loved her so much and he trusted her so much that he left his family fortune to her, which led her to her third husband. And finally, she went up the scales of England till she arrived at the top and was married to the Earl of Shrewsbury. At this moment of her triumph, when she arrives, the richest woman in England except for Elizabeth I, one of the greatest women in England except for the duchesses, Elizabeth trusts her to keep Mary, Queen of Scots, in her household. And from that point, almost everything unravels. The New York Times suggested that having Mary, Queen of Scots, arrive in your household was rather like having Angelina Jolie as a permanent house guest. <laughs> <laughs> it might be all right, but it's not very likely. Mary, Queen of Scots was phenomenally extravagant. At every dinner, she had to be served with 32 dishes. She had to be seated under a crown of estate. She had to be served by people who knelt for her. And she had to have an entourage, a permanent entourage of 100 people. This is not something that any family could afford for very long, and, and the Talbots were assured that Mary, Queen of Scots, would come with to them for a matter of weeks. She actually stayed for 16 years. And at the end of it, they were financially ruined, the marriage was in shreds, and Bess of Hardwick lost the house that she had built from the ground up with her second husband. It was a terrible event for her. But what I like about her so much is that she just went off and she built another house. <laughs> And she built the house Hardwick Hall, which any of you have ever been to in England, or you can go on my website and have a look at the pictures. She's a phenomenal character. And what I wanted to read to you was just a little bit from the very, very, it's the very first page of the novel. And it's probably my favorite page in the whole novel. And then I'll take questions. 1568, autumn, Chatsworth House, Derbyshire, Bess. Every woman should marry for her own advantage since her husband will represent her as visible as her front door for the rest of his life. If she chooses a wastrel, she will be avoided by all her neighbors as a poor woman. Catch a duke, and she will be your grace, and everyone will be her friend. She can be pious. She can be learned. She can be witty and wise and beautiful. But if she is married to a fool, she will be that poor Mrs. Fool until the day he dies. And I have good reason to respect my own opinion in the matter of husbands, having had three of them, 
and each one, God bless him, served as a stepping stone to the next, until I got my fourth, my Earl, and I am now my Lady Countess of Shrewsbury, a rise greater than that of any woman I know. I am where I am today by making the most of myself and getting the best price of what I could bring to market. I am a self-made woman, self-made, self-polished, and self-sold, and I'm proud of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm very happy to take questions or comments. There's a microphone just there, and there's another one just there. Or you can shout. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's a question, a very sensible question, about how do I write? Is it in the morning or in the afternoon, or how do I organize my day? And there's a very silly answer to it, which is that I write pretty well whenever I feel like it, and I write anywhere. I write on a laptop, so I take it with me anywhere I choose to go. And uh, my husband, who I, I'm sorry to say has no respect for the person I would really regard as England's greatest living author, <laughs> <laughs> points out to me that I'm much more productive in the English soccer season because he puts the television on, he hogs the television for the whole of the autumn and winter. And I sit in the sitting room and I write my novels while the football is on. So every time they make the season a little bit longer, he goes like, it's, it's good for us, really. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, I both uh, read the book repeatedly as the other boiling girl and saw the movie. How much control did they allow you to have over the movie script? The story of the relationship between the author to the movie is always, I think, a, a troubled and a fraught one. Mine was particularly easy because uh, they appointed me as a consultant and they paid me to be a historical consultant. And they would send me a copy of the script and the directions and everything they were going to do and I would send them a memo which would say, this is absolutely ridiculous, this is <laughs> totally historically invalid, and I cannot possibly support this. And they would say, thank you, Miss Gregory, for your opinion, <laughs> and do exactly what they were going to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I felt that I had performed my job, which was consulting, and they had performed their job, which was making the movie they wanted to make. <laughs> However, I thought it came out really very well. I think I, I think I altered maybe two things, which was, you know, pretty good. And uh, there are a few things in it which I found uh, beautifully ridiculous, but they didn't particularly matter. There's a particular scene, those of you who have seen the movie, Anne Boleyn comes back from France. Why she's been in France, I'm not entirely sure, but it means she comes back from France. There's this beautiful and very expensive ship on the English Channel. And then there's these fabulous horses galloping along the sands. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful, long, long, big, great movie shot. And we were watching this in, in one of the early stages. And I leaned towards my husband and said, because Dover Port was closed that day. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in movie terms, it's a great image. It's one of the most beautiful scenes in the movie. And they were right to do it that way. It just happens, it's ridiculous. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Shout at me. This is a question about the constant princess. I have to say it's politically controversial. Uh, I'm not worried. Uh, the, the question is, is that how was it that uh, Catherine of Aragon, who came from Spain, who was the daughter of Isabella of Castile, who conquered Spain against the Moors and returned Spain to the, to the Spanish and expelled both the Moors and the Jews. How was it possible that Catherine of Aragon, brought up in that environment, could have any sympathy with Moorish medicine and Moorish literature and uh, the Moorish way of life? And I think really it's because we misunderstand what that war was about. It was absolutely about Isabella and Ferdinand driving ultimately the Moors out of Spain. But before that, the Moors had been in Spain for hundreds of years, and they had lived under a system which they called the Conviviencia. 
And I deliberately wrote about this very, very consciously that it, I was writing at a time in which the West was experiencing huge difficulties in feeling any sympathy or understanding for our Muslim brothers and sisters. And it seemed to me absolutely important that I should represent a society which had lived for centuries side by side, both of us benefiting very, very much from the other's culture. In the Tudor period, in the Renaissance period, the Renaissance is fueled by the Muslim world. It is Arab maths, Arab science, Arab astronomy, Arab medicine that drives the arrival into the Western world of these things which we then take on and make such a, a triumph of culturally. Catherine of Aragon would have used a Muslim doctor or a Jewish doctor because there weren't any good in a sense, non-Muslim or Jewish doctors. That was the tradition of learning. And I wanted, it's possible that she might have been, of course, we don't know. She may well have been a rabid racist. <laughs> she may well have been a terrible crusader. She may, may well have been someone who was very, very keen on that sort of thing. But certainly we know that in her mother's court, they wore Arab dress. They went straight into the Alhambra palace and they lived as Moors, though they were Christians. They Christianized the temples, but they lived as a Moorish prince would do. So I think there was a much greater integration and interest in each other's culture and sympathy for each other's culture. And I wanted to represent that because I thought I could learn from it. Thank you. Interesting question. Yes, ma'am. The question is, how did I decide that Mary was not in fact an idiot and I could be interested in her? It truly was doing a bit of proper research, you know, which is always a good thing to do. I mean, I read this one biography and then I read a series of other biographies and it, in a sense, what I do is I read through the history, that the history is often very biased and it is often very prejudiced against women. And I just have to read it and try and, try and filter the, the colors that, that, that would make you think, in, for instance, in the case of Catherine Howard, this absolute belief that she was a young, misbehaving, silly. You know, David Starkey, a modern historian, calls her a silly slut. You go like, you, you know, that is so meaningless in terms of understanding a woman's behavior. So in a sense, I read history, but I read it always with kind of keeping my feet on the ground and saying, if you were there, if you were that woman, would these, would these acts be reasonable? And I think Mary Queen of Scots' decisions and life is that of a very, very reasonable woman doing the best she can in impossible circumstances. Thank you, I'll come to you. Um, one of my favorite characters in The Other Boleyn Girl was George Boleyn. And I went to school in England, and the entire time that we had covered the Anne Boleyn and everything, nothing ever came up that she had a brother. So it was very interesting when I read your book that, oh, she had a brother. But what was your inspiration for his dialogue? Because I really liked that he was, you know, blunt and sarcastic and, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, he is an absolute kind of invisible uh, character. And, and I just thought that was so interesting because th the family did not cherish Anne particularly. There was no reason to do so. Neither she nor Mary. They didn't record the dates of their birth even. They were so unimportant. They were just girls. So, you know, in the Tudor world, they would be deployed into the court. They would be married for advantage. And in the case of both Anne and Mary, they would be put in the way of the king in case some profit could be made from the fact they were pretty girls. George Boleyn, ironically enough, would have been the absolute focus of parental attention because he would be the heir. And so they really worked on, in a sense, bringing him on and coaching him. And they trained him in languages so that he could go abroad and be a diplomat. And I thought that from his point of view, if you were, in a sense, absolutely, you know, the favored, the boy, you know, the important boy of the family, and you saw your sisters just glide into such wealth and privilege by virtue of just being pretty girls, that you would be a bit sarcastic about it. Yeah. And so in a sense, that's all I had. I had nothing more than that. We know almost nothing about him, mm -hmm. except this terribly tragic death as a result of Anne's ambition. Thank you. I can take one more. Oh, I'll take two really fast. You go, and then I'll come to you. As the woman that you are, how do you feel about Henry VIII? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, because of, you know, Henry and I, have been together for something like 10 years now. <laughs> I am the seventh wife. Um, 
If you look at my Henry and the Constant Princess, he's a boy of 10. I drew, I drew everything I knew about boys and put it into Henry, and I think he's delightful, he's spoilt, but he's a sweetheart. You couldn't help but love him. Um, what happens is that he's absolutely spoiled, you know, by his grandmother, by his father, and then ultimately by the court that gathers around him. When he's Catherine of Aragon's husband and he loves her, married to a good woman, I, I, I share it with you, it's the only thing keeps him right. You know, as soon as he gets rid of the first wife, it goes wrong for him. Uh, you know, I hope you take that and consider it. <laughs> He's fine then, but as, as power corrupts him completely, as his health goes, and I really genuinely believe that it, towards the end of his life, he's actually mentally ill, he's paranoid, and he's mad. And England is ruled by a madman, and nobody dares say, stop there, that, you know, we have to stop. So it's a very, it's a very interesting, uh, it, it's a long life, and so I think of him very differently at different parts of it. Thank you. I promise you, go. There's a very nice bit about how great I am, <laughs> which is always good to hear. And then there was a question, given that it's so important to have a boy, did anybody try and pass off a boy? I sort of suggest in the novel that Anne may have considered trying to find a surrogate father, as it were, um, for a son. There isn't, the only one that's really dubious is uh, the uh, alleged son of James, the second. Uh, where there's this great warming pan story where uh, nobody's allowed in and out of the confinement chamber for exactly for that reason. And there's a great rush and a flurry and somebody says, she really needs a warming pan, like in the middle of childbirth. The one thing you'd be going was like, mm, a little bit chilly. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody charges in with a warming pan and then they say, yeah, it was a boy. Uh, and there was a great deal of suspicion about whether there was a, boy, a baby boy tucked in the warming pan or not. But that's the only incident I know about where we've really questioned it. Um, of course, uh, our current Prince uh, Harry has some doubts about his parentage, but I wouldn't want to share vulgar gossip with any of you. <laughs> I really have to stop there. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.